the ESP32 has become a mainstream maker platform. This is why we got many different boards to choose from. Which one fits your project? Let's get an overview and test the boards. And of course, we will add the information to our comparison table from the last videos. Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. Remember, if you subscribe, you will always sit in the first row. Here are the contenders. Eight boards from number 27 to 35. Most of them are available on AliExpress and some also on Banggood. Only one is from Sparkfun. In this comparison, I did not include boards made in Europe and only one made in the USA. Maybe this will change in the future. At the end of the video, you will know why. All boards use the standard ESP32 chip. Maybe I will do an introduction to the ESP32 S2 boards in a future video. For my last ESP32 board videos, number 193 and number 201, I had clear criteria. Most of them are still valid. Some like chip version or does the board crash if you disconnect USB are no more needed because these problems do not exist anymore. The rest of the criteria are still valid. Does the board use a shielded module or just an ESP chip soldered on the PCB? How many pins are broken out to pin headers? Does the board come with an antenna connector for an external antenna? Is the board breadboard friendly? How readable is the pin labeling? Does the board have an additional flash button? Is a battery switch available? Which battery connector is needed? What type of voltage regulator and Li-Yon management chips are used? How much current does the board consume from the battery and from USB? And how fast can it charge the battery? Some boards have additional components like displays, SD card slots, PSRAM and I2C connectors. Two boards have no battery connector and no charging chip. What are the results of the investigation? The first one is obvious. Liligo with its TTGO brand manufactures many boards and only a few are from other manufacturers. One is Wemos with its Lolin boards. The next observation. There are two form factors. One with two pin rows, usually also narrow enough to leave one row of pins on each side on a breadboard. Or the much smaller boards with four rows of pins. They cannot be used on breadboards, but this form factor is my favorite for projects. A third finding is, only two boards use the V-Rover module with additional PSRAM. Fortunately, one for each form factor. This might be important if you use MicroPython for your projects. Only one board has a display. For some projects, small displays are convenient. I suppose you remember the small finder for weather balloons in video number 360 or the Meshtastic communicator in video number 337, where the T-beams small OLED displays were helpful. For most projects, such small displays are too small or you want to have more freedom where to mount it in your box. The Lolin D32 Pro is probably made with such a project in mind. It has an additional display connector. Too many boards have SD card slots. I say this because I never used an SD card on a connected device. I always transfer the data to a server. Two boards have a built-in I2C connector. This might be an advantage for a development system if you standardize your sensors on a particular connector. I usually solder the wires directly to the deployed boards, so I do not need a connector. And as a development platform, I use this Keys Studio board with this base plate. For each pin, it also offers a ground and a 3.3 volts pin. Very handy, because for most projects, I need more ground pins than available on the standard boards. This board, by the way, 
also has three 5 volt pins. It has no battery, which is not a problem for a development board. The only disadvantage I found is that I have to push the boot button to upload. Maybe you know the correct board definition to avoid that. Power consumption is essential for battery operated devices. This is why I did my own measurements and did not believe the data sheets. How did I test the current consumption? I distinguished between the ESP32 chip or module and the rest of the circuitry. ESP32 chips and modules do not differ a lot in consumption, so the difference must come from the parts added by the board manufacturer. This is why I measure when the MCU is idle. Like that I can easily see the differences coming from the added components. I wrote a sketch with two phases, running idle and deep sleep. Like that I was able to read the values during the two phases. Before we look at the results, I want to focus on something interesting. In the previous tests, boards used different charging and regulator components. This time we nearly always find the same chips. The LTC4054 as a charger and the ME6211 as a voltage regulator. So I would not expect significantly different behaviors of the boards. Will this become true? The first tests are connected to USB power. I insert a simple USB ampermeter to measure idle current without a connected battery. As expected, the idle currents are very similar at around 40 mA for all boards. I did not measure deep sleep current because it is not essential if we have USB power available. Next, I connect a small Lyon battery and measure the maximum charging current to a discharged battery using a multimeter. This shows us how fast a battery can be charged, for example with solar power, or how long we have to wait while charging. All boards use either the bigger JST-PH or the smaller GH connector. It is always good to have a bunch of such prefabricated cables in your lab. Most boards charge with around 500 mA, which is ok because more current could become dangerous for small batteries. The T1 charges at 350 mA, which is probably still ok for most scenarios. Next, how much current do they use during battery operation? Because this measurement is delicate, particularly if you want to measure the deep sleep current precisely, I use this OTI. It replaces the battery and provides exactly 3.7 volts to the battery connector of the board. Here you see the current curve. First a peak when the chip starts and all capacitors have to be charged. Then a lengthy delay where I can measure the idle current. Then deep sleep. I select a range and read the average current. You can watch video number 47 if you are interested in deep sleep and how to calculate battery run times. All boards consume around 40 mA when the CPU is idle. Very similar to our previous measurement with USB power. No surprise because all boards use linear regulators. These regulators reduce the voltage but nearly the same current flows at the output and the input. Let's continue with the deep sleep, measured in microamperes. Traditionally we find a lot of differences in this discipline. Also this time, the SparkFun board consumes 6240 microampere. I have no clue where this power is used. It even has no always on LED. The best is the Lolin D32 with 70 microampere. A good value because this small battery would power such a board in deep sleep for more than 500 days. Then come the D32 Pro and the T display. Both also have no always on LED but consume 200 and 300 microampere. The D32 Pro has a V Rover module with an additional PS RAM. I did not find information on how much the PS RAM consumes during deep sleep. The infamous leaders in this discipline are the little T7, V1.3 and the T1. 
both with a whopping 1500 to 1600 microampere. Why is that? Because of stupidity. Both have an LED which is always on. Also during battery operation, as we see here in the diagram. But even if I desolder the LED, the T7 version 1.3 consumes 870 microampere. Not good. Up till now, this was my favorite board for battery operated projects because of its size. I still will use it with a small 6 volt solar panel attached to it as I did in my light sensor project. As we see on this chart, the solar panel can keep the battery voltage constant even during winter in Switzerland. We will have the shortest day around Christmas and the battery still is fully charged. The sensor transmits its value every 10 minutes, by the way. Fortunately, the T7 version 1.5 with the V Rover module has a similar form factor and after desoldering the power LED only consumes 78 microampere. Much better. I think after this video, this will become my favorite board for battery operated projects. Till I get one of the boards from the superpower project of video number 351, of course. Anything else to mention? The documentation for the TTGO and LOLIN boards is good. Usually they even provide a diagram. I added the links to the table. Like that you find details like where is the LED or the buttons connected. And the pins of the boards are clearly labeled, sometimes even on both sides. For breadboard usage, top labeling is best. For soldering wires, it depends on which side you solder the wires. I prefer from the top to stick the boards with double-sided tape. So top labels are my favorite. The Life D1 Mini is my favorite board for USB powered projects, by the way. You find a link to this table in the video description. I did not delete the older boards. Maybe you have one lying around and want to know how it compares with the newer boards. Did I forget anything? Yes, the prices. After the shutdown of civil aviation last spring, shipping costs increased considerably. Now shipping is sometimes more expensive than the board itself. Often it does also not help to order more than one because shipping costs increase fast. Sometimes it's even cheaper to place two orders instead of one with the needed number of parts. When I recently bought products from DigiKey or Mauser, I learned that they deliver free of charge if I order for more than $60. All customs hassle avoided, delivered at my front door in two or three days. Like that, products from Adafruit suddenly become more competitive. I will have a close look at this situation and at Amazon's role in distributing parts for our needs. Maybe I will create a video about that topic. Summarized. We got new and improved ESP32 boards, mainly from Liligo and Wemos. They come in two form factors, small with two double pin rows and bigger with two single pin rows. A lot of them have a battery connector and a Li-Ion charger on board. Very convenient for battery operated projects. The power consumption, if powered from USB or during regular operation, was nearly the same for all boards. Unfortunately, I still found significant differences in current consumption for deep sleep. Sometimes also because of stupidity. Two boards have power LEDs also during battery operation. If we remove these LEDs, at least one board of each form factor has an acceptable deep sleep current consumption. The other boards with batteries still can be used for solar powered projects. All boards have lots of pins. It should not be a problem to connect sensors and displays. Many boards offer an SD card slot, if you need something like that. The documentation of the boards is much better than in the past. Usually we get an official diagram. Prices, mostly shipping costs, went up considerably since the last videos. That's all for today. As always you find all the relevant links in the description. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. 
If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. Thank you. Bye.